Perfect. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Hello. Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to our third Unapologetically Free workshop. Unapologetically Free is an initiative brought to you by UNCF, Thurgood Marshall College Fund, and the Steve Fund. Um, it also includes a healthy mind study, conferences for faculty, staff, students, and a series of workshops. Today's workshop is my student is having a mental health crisis. Now what? This will be recorded and made available to you online after this session. While participants will be muted on this webinar, feel free to use the Q&A function to ask any question and respond to questions in the chat. Throughout the session, we will open the chat box for you to provide comments and ask questions as well. Next slide, please. My name is Rajay Branch. I am the Director of Families and Special Projects at the Steve Fund. The Steve Fund focuses on supporting the mental health and emotional well being of young people of color. The Steve Fund works with colleges, universities, nonprofits, researchers, mental health experts, families, and young people to promote programs and strategies that build understanding and assistance for the mental health and emotional health of the nation's young people of color. I have the pleasure of introducing our facilitator for this afternoon, Dr. Jan Collins Eaglin. Dr. Jan Collins Eaglin serves as a senior national advisor for the Steve Fund. At the Steve Fund, she serves as a university consultant and webinar presenter, among many other things, on mental health and wellness resources and programs for our BIPOC students. Previously, she was the Senior Associate Dean of Students for Wellness and Personal Success for Pomona College. Prior to Pomona College, she was the Director of Michigan State's University's Counseling Center, and that included alcohol support services, sexual assault counseling, and testing center. As a graduate of the University of Michigan Combined Program in Education and Psychology, she was an American Psychological Association Minority Fellow and Center of Education of Women Fellow. Her research is on depression among African-American women. She developed nationwide mental health programs for African-American women through Alpha Kappa Alpha Incorporated and the Lynx Incorporated both international African-American women's community service organizations. For both organizations, she consults on interpersonal dynamics within chapters and provides workshops and seminars on helping chapters and members thrive personally and through community service. So without further ado, Dr. Collins Eaglin, take it away. Thank you so much, Rajay, and um, thank you, UNCF, for inviting me and also participating in Unapologetically Free. I love the title. Next slide. So we're gonna start with a mindfulness minute. I know all of you either are in at the end of your very busy day are still at the office and, and trying to hopefully attend and not do other things while you're attending. And so I would like you to just put down whatever you have, maybe turn your phone over, just do whatever you can do just to focus for a minute. And in this minute, I would ask for you just to close your eyes. And as you close your eyes, just focus on your body. Focus on what feels good, what doesn't feel good. Focus on your breathing. And now let's just take a deep breath in and hold it and out longer than you held it. So we're gonna breathe in, two, three, hold, two, three, out, two, three, four, five, six. One more time, in, two, three, out, two, three, out, or hold, and then out, two, three, four, 
five, six. Just a moment of stillness. Next slide. So our agenda for today is um, we've done the introductions and we're going to talk about some community agreements. And I, I want to acknowledge that doing webinars and workshops in a Zoom environment can be challenging, but we're going to try to engage you as much as possible. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the question um, or chat feature, and we will try to um, certainly address whatever your uh, questions or comments are. And there will be time when I will ask you to do that. Um, we'll give a brief overview of mental health and um, then look at help seeking and why that is so critical and reflections and then next steps. Next slide, please. Okay, so share at the, comfort, at the level you are comfortable, call in, not out, and if there are any other agreements, I'd like to take a moment, I always do this, and if you think there's something else that we as a community need to make this the best possible webinar possible, just put it into the um, chat feature, if you would. And is there anything that, um, you know, so Rajay or Victoria that you see? Okay. All right, next slide, please. Learning objectives. Let's, the first thing is I want you to understand um, the barriers and strengths related to structural, social, cultural, and identity processes. And we're going to explore the relational context, such as family, peers, mentors, and community networks on mental health. Um, we're going to examine how um, the campus community climate and the broader academic and social context, um, digital and media and virtual spaces impact mental health. And I will talk to you about some interventions that may improve understanding the outcomes for the mental health of your students. Next, okay. So the first thing is, what do you think are the highest stressors that impact student mental health in general? Almost everybody's comments, I think, are being loaded now. 60%. Okay. Waiting just for a few more comments or votes. All right. Is that about it? All right. So, um, you're a very astute audience. Because it is true that finances are one of the top stressors that st impact student mental health. And then you talk about family stress. Social media is huge. Student violence also 
you know, you think about the recent shootings at Michigan State and, and what we see on the news, that greatly impacts um, our students' mental health and then loneliness. And I will say to you, we'll get to this a little bit more, but loneliness probably is second to finances. And this loneliness and social isolation, we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about how that really has quite an impact. It's one of those cultural, um, social, and structural issues that make this generation unique and their response to it. All right, thank you. Next slide. Close this out so I can see. Okay, so um, here are the results. The national higher ed landscape, we know the increase in bias and hate incidents and shootings and violence really impact. And it has a direct impact of what we call secondary trauma, racial trauma that students feel. They don't even have to be the ones in there in the setting, but watching it on TV and talking about it, it is very uh, impactful because for a lot of our students, this may mimic what's going on in their life. Um, challenges to institutional leadership. When leadership changes, what are the values that happen within um, the institution that impacts students of how they see themselves, how they see the college, how they see their um, university and moving on? Student protests and demands. Also, um, impacts their mental health. Again, we're talking about racial trauma from negative media exposure to violence. Um, and then the COVID, the impact of COVID, we're still feeling the impact of COVID. Their families are still feeling the impact of COVID and loneliness that has really come, really been a byproduct of COVID and social isolation. These all have a huge impact. So next slide. So I'm gonna show you some data, some slides about what we know um, based on um, ongoing national survey of mental health on our students. And I know some of your campuses are actually participating in the Healthy Mind Study. And so I'm going to share with you some uh, general data, and then we'll look at more specific for BIPOC students. So if you could back up there just a minute. All right. Um, again, the Healthy Mind Study provides a detailed picture of mental health and related issues. It's a cross-sectional study. Many campuses do it multiple times to get more of a longitudinal picture of their um, students' mental health status. And the beauty of this, this is this really now is the gold standard on understanding student mental health, is that each year more and more campuses are doing it so they have a very robust uh, sample. Next. Okay, so the prevalence of depression. You can see that um, depression is measured by uh, using the PHQ-9. So this is a nine item scale that really addresses symptoms of depression. And um, based on this algorithm, you can have some moderate, severe, and mild depression. And then there's also a suicide um, ideation item on there. So you can see this is just for the general population that 23% um, um, have endorsed being severely depressed. Um, and then 20 moderately, but almost 50% said that they are have had some um, depression. This is not just feeling sad and blue. This really is um, 
symptomology for depression. Next slide, please. And then again, we have our anxiety. And what we are seeing is more and more social anxiety, more and more um, anxiety that's connected to isolation and loneliness. I'm sure many of you have heard students say, I'm having a panic attack or I had a panic attack. And so anxiety has become another major mental health factor for students. So you can see 18% endure severe anxiety, 20% moderate. But here we have over a third of our students that are saying that they have anxiety and they have had this anxiety during the time, the past two weeks. That's a lot. Next slide, please. And here we talk about loneliness again. How often do you feel lonely? Again, within the last couple of weeks, um, one, you lack companionship, 34%, feeling left out and feeling isolated from others. And so you could see that 70% feel isolated from others. If you think about this, um, the dark number is hardly ever, but then you have these other numbers and that's a lot of loneliness, feeling left out, not having a sense of belonging and lacking companionship. Next slide, please. The other uh, issue that I would really like to talk about is help seeking. So why do students come to our office or not? Why do they seek out help or not? And who do they seek it out from? So there's formal help seeking, which are going to an office, going to a person whose job it is to deliver help. And then there's informal. So you can see that the students, 43% um, go to a friend. This is what I call the blind leading the blind. And um, also the next highest one is 39% going back to their family member. And I know this has been going on for a while, particularly with phones, but students are on the phone with their parents all the time. And so they're asking them questions. And, and so the family member now um, is trying to help them resolve whatever issue it is, particularly around mental health and help seeking. And then 15% roommates, which always makes me catch my breath because that truly can um, be a very um, problematic way for students to think they're getting help unless there are some interventions that happen and we'll talk about that next. Next slide, please. So what are the barriers? What are the barriers to our students coming to seek help? First of all, the biggest barrier is stigma. And what is that stigma of seeking help? Do they have a stigma that if I seek help, it's a sign of weakness? Or another stigma is I think less of the other person if they seek help. So there are other pieces, there are other ways to really think about barriers to help seeking. So one is finding appointments, um, financial reasons. Again, we're coming back to finances and finances are huge. But a third are saying, I don't have a need for services. And yet we saw previous data saying they're depressed, they're anxious and they're lonely. But a third is saying, I don't have a need for it. Um, and then we have, again, 21% saying, I'd rather deal with it myself or go to my family and friends. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. 
Now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about BIPOC student mental health, okay? And BIPOC is the more current term for students of color, for those that may or may not know that. And so we have another poll. What do you think are the major stressors for BIPOC students? All right, let's look at these responses. And these responses look a little different than the other responses, don't they? So we're talking about family stress. A lot of our students are very connected to their families, feel responsible for them. Some are working and sending money to their families. Others know what their families are sacrificing to have them there. Others worry about family safety. So this family stress is a big issue. And again, finances are a huge issue. Loneliness, social media. What are students seeing? What is this generation seeing um, that social media that they compare themselves to? And they're constantly comparing themselves to. And then violence, violence at home, violence on campus, violence all around them. All right, thank you. So let's let's look at some data points. Next slide, please. Um, high levels of stress impact mental health for black people living in the US. Uh, black Americans, 48% report discrimination as a stressor in their life. So that's another piece that race and race related trauma also impacts our students' mental health. Next slide, please. Students of color had this, and, and this is a really interesting, very, very interesting. And it's something that I think we all need to understand and a possible way to take action. Students of color had the lowest rate of mental health service utilization. So there is a treatment gap between what is needed and then the treatment received. And, and this gap puts our students at risk. And what it does is if you have a mental health concern, then it's going to impact your academics. It's going to impact whether you come to class or not, are you showing up? It's going to impact the actual performance because if you have a mental health issue, your thinking, your cognition, your ability to concentrate, reading, all of that is impacted and it's negatively impacted. So we don't see the best of our students. We're not getting the best of what they hope to give and what can happen. So this treatment gap is an issue for us. Next slide, please. Other factors leading to mental health issues that we've talked about, but I, I wanna stress is um, they are more likely 
to experience racism, discrimination, either on campus or off campus. So I'm talking within, remember at the beginning, we talked about some social determinants of mental health issues. So you may not see this on your campus, but in the community at large, in the community where they have to get jobs and where they're interacting with their families. So we wanna think of this in a broader way. Um, Islamophobia, cyberbullying, verbal and physical assaults, microaggressions. And I also wanna bring in that's not listed here is also um, sexism and then um, um, discrimination and hate and violence against LGBTQ students. So there's a lot going on here that can actually damage their mental health and impact their mental health. Um, and these experiences also can lead to alienation, isolation, marginalization, and loneliness. Now, I'm going through all of this because this is what you'll see in the classroom. Next slide, please. So from the Healthy Mind Network Symposium, here are some ways that faculty report having conversations with students regarding their mental health. 79% um, report having one-on-one -on -one phone, video, email conversations with students. So uh, these may be the students that come to you at the last minute because they can't finish the class. They want a maybe an incomplete, but they haven't been there long enough to have an incomplete. Um, it, a variety of reasons. Um, the mental health conversation varies by faculty discipline and faculty gender. Who feels comfortable talking to whom? Next slide, please. Three quarters of faculty are likely to reach out if a student is in distress, but only one half have a good idea on how to recognize this. And, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that in terms of recognizing it. So you can see that these two um, issues are really important and everybody needs more training or more information or more resources of where to go and how to get there. Next slide, please. And that this study shows the faculty will welcome more resources and hopefully this will give you more today. Um, you're motivated to strengthen your role in supporting students, but you're not the community mental health person. And so that means there are different ways that you have to go about this. Um, and then um, having a list of mental health resources, a checklist of things to consider regarding warning signs, mental or emotional distress is important. Okay, next slide, please. So the summary, student trends. We find that students, a third of our students are not flourishing, okay? So that's gone down. Depression by 135% has gone up. Anxiety by 110% has gone up. Eating disorders has gone up. Non-suicidal self-injury has gone up. So in other words, we've got a population that needs a lot of help. Next slide. So we're going to talk about interventions. Next slide. So the approach I'm going to talk about is what we would call a trauma-informed approach. And the trauma-informed approach, first of all, looks at safety. So does the student feel safe talking? And so we always want to help students feel safe. Trust is a big issue. Can they trust you? And if they can trust you, that's a, a big step in moving forward. Peer support is an important resource. And so it is something to look at at your campus. Do you have a peer program, a peer support program? Because students talking to peers help. 
I'm not talking about peer counseling though. That's a whole different thing, but peer support, they could find information from their peers. The peers can help them, guide them. And so that's important. Collaboration and mutuality. How can you work together? How can you work together with the counseling center? How can you work together with other resources on campus? And helping the student have a voice and have a choice. And then understanding the cultural got uh, historical um, realities of their lives. Next slide, please. So what is a, the most important, for me, the most important thing that faculty can do um, is not to be the mental health counselor, okay? That's not your job. But the most important thing is to build trust among your students. And the way to do that is to in your syllabus, emphasize the importance of mental health. Include a personal statement about your own values and beliefs. And this also goes with disabilities. So if, they're, if they feel like they are not able to function in the class, then refer them to the disability office. And um, let students know that you will work with them, but also let them know your boundaries. And so there are ways there that you have some clear definitions about what you can accept and what you can, but also leave the door open for helping them. And, and to say, you know, I'm happy to listen to you and refer you. Maybe sometimes you even have to go with them to the counseling center, to the dean's office, some place where they can get help. Because if they feel safe with you and you go with them, that goes a long way. So working in the dean's office, um, wellness was one of my uh, job descriptions. And whenever a faculty would walk a student over, I would um, do everything to get that student in faster than maybe I would if they came by themselves because I know it's a crisis because you don't have that kind of time to walk students over. So doing small things like that, you become the model um, to address mental health concerns. Next slide. The next thing that is really important is to have some sort of bystander intervention training. And this is something that you can ask from your student affairs division. So bystander intervention for faculty is really, really important. And there are a number of programs out there. There are a number of models out there that are very easy. And we've done it. I've done faculty training where it is a webinar model. There's asynchronous faculty training where you can go through um, what the warning signs are, um, such as question, persuade, and refer. There are um, online training such as Cognito. And then there are some brief online interventions on helping students promote self-efficacy and creating misperceptions about mental health. And so these are things that can be in your toolkit and you can ask your campus for them. And we can work together to figure out which ones are the best ones for you. But that way, in this one webinar, introducing you to the full scope of this would be, it would be just too much for you to take in, but this way you can do it on your own at your own time. Next slide, please. The next intervention is a really powerful one because it's bringing the campus community together. It is a, establishing a mental health task force and the task force should communicate a specific focus on mental health to the larger campus community. In other words, a student should know there's a mental health task force and the task force is 
design to improve access, to improve ways that you can um, address the mental health concerns. So when your president ch or chancellor, vice presidents, vice chancellors endorse this task force, people believe is going to happen. It makes a huge difference. It also assists with if you need financial resources, even thinking about how to get them and where to get them. The other is when leaders develop a task force charge, it should be action ordered, um, oriented and specify the desired outcomes. Have it in the newspaper, have it on the website, have it where people will see it because then it's you then become accountable and students are also critical to have on this mental health task force. I always go, go to your student leaders, go to student government. You want to have this spread out and around so that everybody has a buy-in and everybody can say, this is important. I am important. You, the faculty are important. And so it really coalesces good energy and good synergy to make a difference. And then consider stakeholders but consider stakeholders that you may not think about. For example, housekeeping, students talk to them first, and um, groundskeepers, cooks, whoever, whoever touches the student's life, they should be on this task force. Next slide. And so the, the last thing I would like to talk about in terms of interventions is mental health first aid. And this is a program that's free. And um, what I would do when I was working um, in different campuses, in fact, in all the campuses I worked at, I would call on the community mental health office to come and do the training because they are thrilled to do it. And they're trained, their, their staff usually is trained. So that's a free resource that you can bring in. Um, depending on, well, it just depends on your thoughts about training your RAs. Uh, having some version of this is wonderful. I'm a little hesitant for, you know, 18, 19 year olds to think that, that now they've got this information and now they're the, you know, they're the counselor on call, which often happens, but giving them information about warning signs, checking up on their students, making sure everybody leaves the dorm room, Understanding if somebody doesn't leave for one and two days, that's that's not a good sign. Something needs to happen. So those are the kinds of things that we talk about. You as faculty, um, particularly uh, in big schools and small schools, I've had faculty call the dean's office or the counseling center saying, I haven't seen this student in X amount of days. I am worried. Can you do a welfare check? Can you check up on them? And I have never um, experienced somebody saying no. All right, next slide. So when I talk about mental health and a mental health crisis, the most important thing is to think about what do we need to take care of ourselves? What are those self-care practices that um, you can share with your students, like on your syllabus? And you can model for yourself and for them, what does it mean to take care of yourself? And um, next slide. So there are many kinds of self-care. There's the physical, exercising, eating right, the mental, just that little brief mindfulness survey, emotional, maybe doing journaling or understanding what your triggers are, spiritual. Spiritual is really, really important. And so meditating, understanding 
their relationship with a higher power really uh, is an important self-care, intellectual, reading and learning, the environment, going out in a green space. Green spaces are really important. And sometimes I would tell students, just go outside and find a piece of dirt, stand on it, because you're standing on the earth. Because some campuses say you cannot step on any grass. So you just, you know, understand where you are, but your environment is really important. And then social networks are critical. So we talked about loneliness and isolation. So promoting social connections and social support and social networks is critical to self-care and wellness. And then also financial, which you absolutely identified. Next slide. So self-care is a trauma-informed practice to support emotional well-being. And you as faculty, again, can just share what your self-care practice is, or just to say in your class, I, I hope all of you have a self-care practice. It's a stressful world. It's a stressful semester. Everybody needs one. Um, it's not a luxury, but a necessity. Um, self-care supports resilience self-efficacy, the belief that I can do it, adaptability, and most of all, academic performance. If I am relaxed, if I am centered, if I am grounded, I have a much better chance of doing well on assignments, papers, exams, whatever project you have for grading. Ongoing self-care boosts your capacity to build healing and relationships and um, respond to trauma. Next slide, please. So I love this. An empty tank will take you exactly nowhere. Take time to refuel. So this is a refueling station, self-care. Next slide. I really like this quote, and, I, and I'm going to read this to you, um, because Bessel van der Kolk is a lead, uh, leading psychologist in trauma and trauma care, and he focuses on children, adolescents, and young adults. And so what he says is the greatest hope for traumatized, abused, and neglected children is to receive a good education in school, which is what you're doing as a faculty, where they are seen and known. Now that's key. Um, where they learn to regulate themselves and where they can develop a sense of agency. And if there's something that UNCF uh, campuses do, is that, that you really see students, you, uh, you really take them under your wing. So I've had three children go through UNCF schools and each of them had to be taken under their wing, uh, somebody's wing at some point, and it made all the difference. Um, at their best, schools can function as islands of safety, in a chaotic world. So what can you do to have to have your space, your office, your classroom be supportive and safe? That's the key here. Um, and then I'll move to the bottom, can play a significant role in instilling the resilience necessary to deal with the trauma of neighborhoods, I would say, and or families to be the places where young people are taught self-leadership and an internal locus of control. Um, so can you tell me how much time do I have? Next slide. I'm looking at my little notes down here. All right. Oh, good. I'm good, I'm good. Okay, so I wanna show you a, a self-care, just brief three minutes of a self-care video. And just to let you know, the first student who talks 
will it's in Spanish, so don't don't worry, you're on the right video, okay. <laughs> This is from the Clay Center. It's a great resource. Para mí es cuidarme mentalmente, porque si estoy bien aquí, el resto va a estar bien. Pero si lo que está aquí no está bien, ahí es donde se puede ir muy, muy mal. Hola, me llamo Luis García. I'm Cedric Kerr. My name is Ariel. I'm Jessica. Estoy en mi segundo año de colegio. One more class to graduate. I went, already went into college. Um, already burned out, honestly, like with just school, and I was tired. And from going to class, working full time at a retail store, having a girlfriend, and also just trying to balance the other roles in my life as a friend and as a daughter and um, as a roommate. Y hasta un punto, un poco de depresión, y no creo que era muy bueno. I ended up dropping out after a few months, um, just because it was. Is too big of a change for me or too hard on me for whatever reason. Being Hispanic, black, white, I was like, I couldn't confirm to a group because everyone looked at me differently. I think there were moments of <clears throat> just a lot of physical and mental exhaustion. Se me aprieta atrás del cuello. Like the shortness of breath, kind of like I can't breathe. I felt like I was done with the world. I was like, so upset, sad, angry. Y arriba de la cabeza se aprieta y se siente todo uh, rojo. I kept everything so bottled in. And eventually it's going to build up and like boil. It's like a volcano. It's like, you know how they get Como si va a explotar y pum. Es bueno. Nam yo reggaeton, nam yo reggaeton, nam yo reggaeton, nam yo reggaeton, nam yo reggaeton. I had to reach out to friends before I did anything suicidal or anything. I had to like really reach out to friends and open up. When I first went to college, I was like, it's hard for me to really express myself to say, hey, this is what I've been through. This is what I'm going through. And is there a way that you could just listen to me? I'm in the process of learning about self-care. What I found for me that I like to do is to journal you know, writing out my thoughts and just allowing myself to kind of process what's been going on and all the new things that are happening. It makes me feel, I guess, more in touch with myself. No estaba feliz. No estaba feliz con la situación en, en donde estaba. Y por eso yo busqué formas de ayudarme yo mismo. Cuando te metes en este lugar de meditación, se te aclara toda la mente. Estás enfocado en lo que necesitas. Cuando termino, me siento como si peso menos. Me siento ligero. Me siento que mi cabeza no tiene todas estas cosas que hacen mi vida más difícil. All right. That's all. Thank you. Next slide. Um, I, I put that little video in because students come to you for so many different reasons and just thinking about simple ways of self-care will help them manage themselves and regulate their emotions so they don't explode and boom and also we know the number one reason students stop out and drop out you would think is finances yes that's a big one but it is depression and it is the anxiety and just feeling hopeless. So next slide. I would like for you to think about what are your self-care practices and what can you share with students? We don't have time to share this, but I would like you to think about it and then think about what could you share? And wouldn't it be a powerful moment in your class, whatever you're teaching, to say, you know, I, I went to this little workshop and I just wanna share it with you about the pressures you're under and the need for self-care. And I hope you do some, not hard. So let's talk about our key takeaways here. 
Um, I shared with you the data regarding mental health issues of students and how the social, cultural environment and determinants impact their mental health. I talked to you about data relating to the BIPEC mental health issues. I've talked about faculty perceptions of students coming them to seek help and some interventions. And most of all, I talked about self-care. And I hope that these takeaways is something that you can use today, tomorrow, um, and in the future. And thank you very much for coming on and spending an hour with us just to help your students. You're the best. Thank you. Hello everyone, sorry for right now, it's not letting me share my video. Can y'all see me now? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Eaglin, we greatly appreciate it. Um, hello everyone, my name is Victoria Smith. I'm a strategy analyst with the Institute for Capacity Building at UNCF. Yes, we can get you all a copy of this wonderful presentation. I saw the question in the chat pop up. Um, absolutely, just a little bit about UNCF with the few minutes that we have left um, in the Institute for Capacity Building. We are focused on the transformative work of institutions through initiatives like Unapologetically Free, and we are rooted in the history of change that HBCUs have left for us, and we are building upon that legacy. Um, next slide, please. So uh, this is one of our webinars in our webinar series, but the next event that we have coming up is our student conference. I um, want to thank you all so much for being here. And um, like Dr. Evelyn talked about, uh, we know that you are here because you care about your students. So I would challenge or task you all, um, as Dr. Eaglin talked about the task force, if you could please share the upcoming student conference with your students. We're gonna have many resources for them. So you can just tell five to 10 of your students or students that you come in contact with, we would greatly appreciate it um, to continue this conversation and provide them the space to gain these invaluable mental health resources. Um, additionally, we do have, we are gonna continue the conversation for faculty and staff and admin as well at um, UNCF ICB's Unite Conference, which is this summer. So we hope you all register for that as well. But yes, um, what is in April, April 11th from 3.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. on the 11th and 12th, um, is our student conference. And once again, we appreciate all of you for being here and taking time out of your evening to learn these resources to powerfully impact your students. And if you wouldn't mind also taking this brief survey um, to let us know how this uh, webinar went and what you learned from it and things that can be improved for next time. Once again, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for caring about the mental health of your students, it is greatly appreciated.
Uh, all righty. Are we good to stop the recording?